Good morning. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I've been asked to come this morning to contribute, like my colleagues, and to give a view of our political system and democracy from the back benches. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and focus very specifically on, on dual reform and give the specific view of, of the government TD, the government backbencher. And I'm going to do that as best I can without getting in too much trouble. Um, <laughs> the title of my address to you today is Show Up and Shut Up, subtitled The Button Pusher, a cautionary tale of a backbench TD author irrelevant. Um, good luck for staying out of trouble. Here it goes. Uh, it's not an address at all, actually, uh, but rather I'm going to read to you a short story. Uh, this is the story of Backbencher, a newly elected TD to the main party in government. He's about six foot two, has dark hair, represents Dublin South East, and has an awfully high opinion of himself. Please, he's no relation. Um, it's two years since the election of March 2011 when we meet Backbencher for the first time. Two years since his election to Dáil Éireann as a new TD, new votes to politics and to the Parliament. He is sitting in his office in the basement of Leinster House. Our story begins. Backbencher was feeling frustrated. He had just spent 20 minutes on the phone to Mary Murphy as she complained to him about the pothole in her road. She knew this wasn't his responsibility, she professed, but her emails to the council were going unanswered and the problem was only getting worse. I'll see what I can do, he said as he finished the call. But what could he do? He had absolutely no responsibility in this area. Well, no official responsibility. He could call up the council's local area office, he knew a guy, and put on a bit of heat. But he'd always told himself he wouldn't be that kind of politician, that he'd be brave and tell people that he was their national parliamentarian and that such work was for the council and to wish them best of luck, etc., etc. But Mary had voted for him. She was in the local tennis club. She knew his mother, and she had told him he was a great lad. And, in fairness to Mary, she had a genuine concern about her road and was getting lost in the labyrinth of a local council's communication system. He could help. He picked up the phone. As he called John in the local area office, he stared at the paper on his desk. Personal Insolvency Bill 2012 was written on the cover. He sighed. He knew it was an important piece of legislation, but when was he going to get the chance to read it, and what was the point anyway? The bells began to ring. Bong, 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 a vote. On what, he wondered. Who knew? He shouted into the adjoining office, add John from the council to my call sheet. His parliamentary assistant decided back. I, I have two degrees, you know. <laughs> yes, he did know. Yeah. She was frustrated too, and who could blame her? Out of his office he went and off to the chamber, and as he made his way, he thought, as he always did, of the Eli in H.G. Uh, Wells' time machine, marching passively to their underground doom at the hands of the Morlocks. Bong, bong. And he thought, as he always did, that this was a very clever comparison to make. Much bustle in the chamber. TDs passing letters to ministers or sitting down with them for a chat. Small groups sharing their latest gossip from the four corners of the counties. What's the vote on? Backbencher asked a colleague. Not sure, came the reply. A motion on Europe, I think. Something to do with the banks, maybe, said another. The chamber was called to order. Backbencher went to his seat on the back row to cast his vote. He looked at the large screen above the can corner with all the bright green lights indicating how his colleagues had voted. Got it, he said, and pushed the green button. Job well done. Another bill enacted. The chamber emptied, but Backbencher remained. There was a full yellow folder of email correspondence on his desk, but he didn't really feel like doing much work that day. He would relax and take a break and so stay in the chamber for the debate. It was report stage on a financial measure of some sort and the opposition spokespeople were objecting to everything. Backbencher had a list in front of him of a dozen amendments practically undoing everything in the bill. What a waste of time, he thought to himself. The amendments could never pass because the government, by necessity, had the majority in the parliament and its party members had to vote in accordance with the government. And the opposition knew this, so why were they bothering? Is it all a big charade, he asked himself? Are we just going through the motions? But then he wondered, if the opposition thought it could get support for its amendments, would it really put down the ones it was putting down? If the parliament was master of its own affairs, if there was no whip on certain issues or certain stages of a bill, say, would the opposition behave differently? Would they perhaps behave more responsibly? Backbencher remembered his days on the council. There they actually debated, and you had to understand the issues, and you had to stand by your vote yourself, no excuses. And he remembered some really great debates where his vote was actually swayed by the passionate contributions of others, where he went in not knowing how he was going to vote, but by listening to the voices of his colleagues and their, their passionate arguments, he was actually swayed to, to a position where good people came together and achieved as a group for their communities and their city what none of them could achieve individually. It, it was probably a debate about speed limits or something, but nevertheless, he felt it was a good point to make to himself. But this, this was important stuff, happening here in the Chamber of Dáil Éireann, and he was part of it. The great debates of decades past and decades to come Backbencher corrected his posture. 
Some colleagues came in to contribute, were called on by the Kian Korla, rose and read their scripts diligently and left. Thanks very much. Backbencher would do the same at five minutes past nine that evening as per his instructions from the whip's office. Yes, the post 9 p.m. slot, he said to himself, reserved for the best and brightest. Backbencher was going to give a ripping speech, <laughs> congratulating and welcoming the minister's bill in equal measure. A speech for the ages. Well, searchable on the Oireachtas website anyway. Backbencher rose and bowed and headed in the direction of the member's bar. The three deputies left in the chamber watched him go. In the back corner of the bar, four of his closer colleagues sat in animated conversation over their cups of tea. It's a disgrace, one said. Total abuse, the other. What's happening, inquired Backbencher. They're guillotining the debate on the new health legislation. To how long? Two hours. Two hours, exclaimed Backbencher. But this is big legislation. It's a big deal to a lot of people. You can't scrutinize 100 pages of detailed legislation in public in only two hours. Well, we're going to, came the swift reply. The group were not happy. This isn't how Parliament is meant to work, one of them formulated. We're meant to be the check and balance on this sort of behavior, the public scrutiny, the breaks. This is exactly the kind of crap that got us into the trouble in the first place. So what, you'll vote against it, another asked? I don't want to vote against it, he replied. But shouldn't I have a right, shouldn't we as a Parliament have a right to say at least, hold on, folks, let's take a bit more time with this, three or maybe four hours at least. I mean, can't we even order our own business, he protested. Well, maybe we should vote against it then, one of them said resolutely, and they all laughed. So what are our options, asked Backbencher. Go up and raise it in the parliamentary party meeting, replied one, and be brandished as a troublemaker, followed the other. Another pot of tea and more bitching and moaning. They were an unhappy lot, these new TDs, now two years in. They just wanted to do their jobs, and upstairs in the parliamentary party meeting, another rant was raging about one thing, but the subtext was really another, and, and that was fine. The backroom politics had to be played somewhere, but did everything have to be played there? Backbencher wasn't going near it. He walked back over to his office with his coffee and a yellow snack bar, uh, the one with the six individual pieces because you get more. And on his chair was the new environment bill with the yellow sticky on the cover from his assistant who had long since gone home. Mm. The backbencher had a system of priority in his office that he thought was quite clever. Things that were most important were left on his laptop, then on his chair, then on his desk, then on the couch chair beside his desk, and then on the floor. <laughs> he flicks to page 12 of the bill. He flicked to page 12 of the bill, and as he had suspected, the minister had not included the piece he had requested. Backbencher picked up the phone and called one of his senior colleagues. I want to put down an amendment on the environment bill. It's a small thing and non-contentious, he said. Yeah. Did you raise it with the minister and his civil servants, asked his senior colleague. I did, but it's not in there. Then it's not going to be in there, he replied. Look, can't I at least put down in, in committee, say, just to make my case, an amendment, just to show people publicly that I'm working, that I care about this issue? You can, came the reply, on my arse. <laughs> Backbencher put down the phone. What's the bloody point, he said to himself. He looked on his laptop and the printed call sheet that had been left there for him, priority number one. It was too late to call John and the council. Next on the list was Aidan, who, according to the sheet, wanted to give out to him about the new property tax. Backbencher sighed and picked up the phone. The day would end soon, he assured himself, and begin again tomorrow. Uh, folks, that's just a, a, a story, a bit of fun, and a very cynical take on the life of a backbencher. It's not all like this, of course. Um, <laughs> he says... Uh, <laughs> just... I mean, for my own sake, um, as a newly elected TD and to Dole Aaron, I sit on the Public Accounts Committee. Every week, a Secretary General from a different department comes in, and we scrutinize line by line the money that's been spent in the previous year, and we try and ensure value for money and appropriate spending. It's important work. Um, I was asked by the Taoiseach to, to lead the uh, Aroxis delegation to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, so every year I monitor elections. In 2012, I monitored the Russian presidential election, and this year in May, I actually led the international team into Bulgaria to monitor their elections, and that's important work too. And thanks to reforms from this government, I've had the privilege to bring my own bill to second stage debate in the chamber, my bill on tax transparency. So I got to stand up and begin the debate and sit there for three hours and conclu conclude the debate. And, and that was, was no small thing, and few people have gotten to do it. And uh, you have a number of TDs who are doing excellent work um, like that. And we heard a contribution playing on of the government TDs, of course, being a captain and all the good work she does in opposition. But, you know, maybe I shouldn't be the person who's complaining. Um, maybe I don't have that right. Only we failed as a nation. Um, we came to a point where we could no longer manage our own affairs. And someone else had to come in, not just to pay the bills, but to tell us how to pay them. We failed. And... You know, we didn't fail in the week of the bailout in 2010, and we didn't fail on the night of the guarantee in 2008. Our failure is older and deeper than that. And 
In addressing the question of what went wrong in our country, we in Fine Gael have placed the blame at the politicians and the political system at the core of it all. You know, politicians bred of a dysfunctional parliament who went on to take executive power, leaving a dysfunctional parliament as their counterbalance in place, and it didn't work. So why are we continuing to make the same mistakes? I mean, yes, this government's reform record uh, when it comes to the Dáil is far better than the previous government's. But the previous government's performance is not a benchmark that I'm interested in. And initiatives like sitting longer, while are a welcome change, it's just sitting longer. It's just tinkering with existing practices. It's not bringing in new practices, which is what we need to do. And while many TDs, new and old, on the back benches of the government do commit themselves to parliamentary work and to national affairs, it's as if we have to force our way into that, into that debate. This mentality of know your place, lad, and bide your time. Well, for some of us who, who came and got elected uh, in the crisis, you know, to get involved, to make a contribution, we don't want to wait. We want to have an involvement now in the national affairs because that's why we stood for election. Last March, I published a short pamphlet, um, and I have it here for distribution, and it's also on, on my website, containing 30 simple reforms for the doll. None are original ideas, and none are that radical. But taken together, I think they could really change uh, for the better our parliament, and as a result, our country. And that we could make leaders of our politicians again. It shouldn't just be about being the Taoiseach or being a minister. Our parliamentarians can be leaders in parliament. Leaders not just of their constituencies, but leaders of ideas. And they could push those ideas and champion them. And we need to create the space for that to happen. We need to see reforms that would have full attendance in the chamber for debates, ban the use of scripts, robust questioning of the Taoiseach and his ministers from all sides of the House, reforms that would empower the member of the Dáil, making them actual legislators again, and forcing them to become involved in the process by allowing them to put down amendments and vote for their amendments, even if that's against the government's wishes, to involve them in the process fully, and not just for the bystanders to it. We need to put parliamentarians in charge of parliament again, ordering our own business, a non hooked vote, picking the Cian Corla in secret ballot. Reforms that would bring much of the backroom of politics, but not all of it, out into the open. And we need to rebuild politics in people's eyes again, and we cannot do that behind closed doors. The times demand greater transparency than that. And none of these law reforms would require a change to the Constitution, would require a new law. All they require is political will. So what are we waiting for? Um, we've been promised new reforms. I've been promised them for two years. And now it seems that the new suite of reforms are contingent on the future of the Shannad, which is a mistake. The need to reform Dáil Éireann is a necessity that stands in its own right. And we can't forget that, because then we will lose sight of the actual fu fundamental reforms that need to be made. And we can give committees new names, and we can change the chairs and, and move seats around like that. But unless we get really fundamental with what we're talking about, and I mean a loosening of the whip system, and become a mature parliament like every other parliament that I have visited in Europe and had the pleasure to, to meet with colleagues, unless we, we get serious about this, we're going to have a crisis because the new people who came into politics, who came from different backgrounds, who are very capable and very passionate about their country and true public servants, will get frustrated and they will walk away. And the ones who remain will eventually, unfortunately, um, and, and history shows us a bit, be, be broken by the system. And they'll, they'll play the game and they'll, they'll do their time. And eventually they'll forget um, the lessons from the bus and they'll forget why they got involved in politics. And 20 or 30 years down the road, we risk ruining it all again. Um, and that, for me, when I, I then sit back and reflect, is why dual reform is so crucial to it all. It doesn't excite everyone. It doesn't light the fire. It's not going to get national headlines. But if we continue to have the dysfunction of parliament, a parliament is n that is not a check and balance on the government, then we are going to make the same mistakes. Because, as was said earlier, there is no monopoly on wisdom. And power is being confined to far too few. And there are new people and new ideas there to, you know, that they can champion and that they want to champion. And we need to now have the maturity to say, it's okay for you to think. It's okay for you to have opinions and to pursue them. That's what we want from you. That's why we elected you. And we know that you're in a party. And of course, you support the party and you make sure that the government stays as government when it comes to the big budget votes and everything else. But you've also got a responsibility to your constituency. And much bigger than that, in the Burkean sense, you have a responsibility to yourself. And the whip system as it's imposed today um, you can't exercise those other two responsibilities, and that will only lead to failure. Um, but anyway, that's the story of Backbencher and his cousin, Owen Murphy. Um, thank you very much for your time.